Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Today, we're answering some of Instagram's burning muzzleloader questions. Every couple of weeks on the I love muzzleloading Instagram page, we'll um, set up and answer people's muzzleloading questions. This video is going to cover some general muzzleloading questions that we receive. We're trying to expand upon and go further than we can explain just in text on Instagram. First up, we have, how did you finish the iron on your Kibler Southern Mounted Rifle? So for all of the hardware on my Kibler Southern Mountain Rifle, I finished it with two coats of Brownells Oxfo Blue. Um, it's a really simple bluing solution. I would coat it in Oxfo blue, let it sit for 15 or 20 minutes, and then scrub it off with a wet Scotch-Brite pad. That wet Scotch-Brite I found works really well to give you a nice even color across all of your metal. I did two coats of that and got kind of a, what I would call like a 35% darkness on my hardware. You can go darker if you want to, depending on what you want. Something to note when you're finishing any kind of metal, whether it's brass, using brass black or iron or browning or, or however you want to finish metal, it can help you make something look older if you leave some areas dark. So I would scrub kind of the center areas of the metal and leave the edges dark, kind of giving a feel for maybe that metal was, you know, being raised up or, or on the edges, caught some more wear and tear and some dirt and grime over the years. It's a really simple way to get into the aging process with your muzzleloader. If you had to choose patched round ball, conical, or modern bullet, what would you pick? Uh, I mentioned it on Instagram. This really depends on the job that I'm trying to do. If I'm hunting, the expansion that you get out of some of the modern inline bullets, really, you get a lot of expansion. And you, you can't argue that if you're going to hunt and you're you know, it kind of helps make up for maybe not the most perfect shot um, when you're hunting, being able to cut through and everything, bring the animal down quickly and ethically. You know, so that's hard to beat when I'm hunting. But if I'm just plinking around and, and just having fun, really the, the round ball is my go-to. I can make them really easy. They're cheap to shoot and they're just a lot of fun. So that's kind of how I feel on that. I don't really like to choose. For me, it's really about what I'm using it for. What is the best, most affordable long rifle kit? Now, a, a lot of these questions are gonna have the same answer when it comes to these. A lot of them are just kind of phrased differently. But I think for me, when it comes to best affordable long rifle kit, it's going to be one of the Kibler kit. I know right now they only have the two. Hopefully we're gonna be hearing later this fall about another release, fingers crossed. But the Kibler Colonial and the Kibler Southern Mountain Rifle, I think are some of the best introductory kits that you can get into, especially if you don't know a whole lot about traditional woodworking or metalworking. Those are some skills that can take some time to get used to. And looking at one of the other kits out there, like a Chambers kit or a Track of the Wolf kit or a kit from Dixie Gunworks or something, there's a lot more work involved to get where you want to go. And the, the Kibler kits, really you don't have to do a whole lot. There's a little bit of finishing, there's a little bit of inletting here and there, but they've eliminated a lot of that. And I think for getting into it, it's really nice to be able to pay the money and have something really nice that you're not necessarily thinking about upgrading as soon as you get it done, um, like you could maybe with some of the cheaper mass-produced kits out there, like from Traditions, the old school CVA kits, and some of the Lyman kits that are out there. Those are all great muzzleloaders. Uh, I've shot quite a bit of them here lately, and they really perform for their cost. So um, it kind of depends on what you're looking for. If you're wanting kind of to get into the long rifle culture, I think definitely get into one of the Kibler kits as your start. Pick the one kind of for your era and your locale. But if you're looking for something to get really started with muzzleloading, start learning how to shoot, maybe hunting with it, it's hard to beat one of the little traditions kits to get started and really familiarize yourself with that process. I went through and I built my Traditions Hawken kit before I even touched my Kibler kit to get kind of a, a feel for what it was gonna take to put together a basic muzzleloader kit. Now I have some experience with woodworking and, and metalworking and things, but it was still nice to pay the extra, I think 300 bucks, 350 bucks, do the Traditions kit first. On a cheaper kit, you can kind of experiment and play with it, get familiar with the techniques that you're gonna need. And I did that before I did the Kibler kit where I was much more concerned with how it was gonna look in the end. There are a million ways to do muzzleloader kits. Um, you just kinda have to find the path that's right for you, but that's kinda what I recommend. Favorite black powder kit, it's gonna be the my Kibler Southern Mountain Rifle. I love the lines, I love the cherry stock, uh, I love the hardware, I love the shape, everything about it. I'm just, a, I'm a real big fan. Does anyone make modern Whitworth rifles? Yes, um, if you can, what you're gonna wanna look for is one of the older Parker Hale reproductions. I have, I'm fortunate enough to have one of those. They're made on the same equipment, is the rumor, 
Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if that's been confirmed or not, but supposedly the Parker Hale Whitworths were made on the same machine equipment, all the same, same factory and things that the original Whitworths were. So you can get kind of a new old Whitworth with one of the Parker Hale Whitworths. But Euro Arms, Dixie Gunworks, and Petter Soli, I believe all offer a modern Whitworth reproduction for you to check out. I've got a 50 caliber CVA Hawk and Rifle and the sights suck, looking for period correct sights. If you're looking for Hawken sights that are a little more traditional and uh, more period correct than what appear on most of the mass produced, even the modern traditions Hawkins, you're gonna wanna look at Deer Creek Products, Dixie Gunworks, or Track of the Wolf. All three of these businesses offer compatible replacement sites in varying degrees of traditional nature for each of these kind of legacy Hawken models. Uh, a lot of them are very similar through time. They've just kind of transitioned into different brands that are selling them now. Um, but Deer Creek Products, Dixie Gunworks, Track of the Wolf should all carry um, some updated sites for you for any of these uh, contemporary Hawkins. How often does a full cylinder accidentally discharge on a cap and ball revolver? And this is something that a lot of people are concerned about, especially um, I think because cap and ball revolvers are a primary introduction for a lot of people into muzzle loading. In my experience though, I haven't seen a whole lot of that. I've, I've hung out with a lot of muzzle loading pistol shooters over the years um, and, and the experience level there is you know, 30, 40 years. So maybe that's why, uh, but I think there are a few steps you can do to mitigate that full cylinder just discharge or chain firing or anything. I, I understand the concerns over it, but I don't know that it is as easy as people make it out to be. Uh, a lot of times when it comes to safety and things, it's important that we all follow safety, especially like eye protection, ear protection things. But I think full cylinder discharge and chain fire is something that we don't see a lot of, but people are really concerned about. From my understanding, there are two schools of thought when it comes to um, chain firing or full cylinder discharge. The first is not capping every cylinder when you're getting ready to fire. Um, so that, that would be if you loaded the cylinder and didn't put a cap on the back, the concern there is that a spark from the ignition comes back around and gets into the nipple on the back of another cylinder. You can prevent that by capping all of your cylinders or not loading every cylinder. Either way, that's a way to prevent it. The second school of thought is not greasing the top of your ball as you put it into the cylinder. Uh, greasing is just a good way to seal everything in there. Make sure you don't get any chain firing. And my friend Black Powder Historian actually brought up a great point that I didn't even consider because um, I'm, I'm so used to it. But in your cap and ball revolver, you want to make sure that you're using a slightly oversized ball so that when you're pressing it into the cylinder, you're shaving off a lead ring. This indicates to you that you have a fully sealed cylinder. There's no way that a spark can get in from one cylinder into another and ignite your cylinder when you don't want it to. What is the best load for a black powder 44 revolver? This really depends on what you're using it for. If you're you know, hunting something with it or if you're match shooting with it, I mean, really, I think when it comes to pistols, you can start around like 20, 25 grains, depending on the yardage that you're shooting and, uh, and start looking at those groups and seeing what you can do to improve them. From there, you can go up or I don't really recommend going down below 20 necessarily, but you can, uh, just like with every muzzleloader, you got to start working in that load and trying to figure out what you need and, uh, and what works best for your muzzleloader. Are there different locks I could use to replace my traditions lock on my Kentucky rifle? Yes, there are. Um, I think when it comes to a lot of the mass produced traditional muzzleloaders, um, currently made by traditions, even going back to some of the Thompson Centers and the CVA stuff, one of the main complaints is the lock, but thankfully a lot of the lock makers now uh, and over the last 40 or 50 years, make a replacement lock that should just drop into that mortise with very minimal work and improve your lock time and the quality of your lock, improve your ignition time and everything. For that specific muzzleloader, Track of the Wolf offers the LR01 from the LNR Lock Company, a very reputable, very well acclaimed muzzle loading lock company that should just drop in to your traditions flint lock. Now it's set up, it has a little bit of a tail at the end of the lock. And if you have the round face traditions lock, this replacement lock is actually marked so you can saw or file that little tail off and fit it to your flint lock. And just like the science that we talked about earlier, Track of the Wolf, Deer Creek Products, and Dixie Gunworks offer a variety of upgrades and replacement parts for some of these other muzzleloaders out there so you can improve what you have and maybe save a little money over buying something new or going custom.
Um, that's something I really like about the muzzleloading market. We're all a big fan of old school technology and uh, a lot of like the sustainability and things that kind of lives in muzzleloading is there with replacement parts. So you don't have to junk something out, even if it's a lock, a trigger, a barrel, anything. You can get replacement parts for a lot of this stuff at an affordable price and really upgrade your setup without breaking the bank. What muzzleloading platform would you recommend for somebody new to muzzleloading? So this is a little bit different than um, recommending the Kibler kit. I really think for somebody new to muzzleloading specifically, the thing to get involved with or the thing to get first is one of the Traditions pistol kits. And I say that because the pistol kits are a little bit cheaper. They're a little bit smaller, so that might be a little bit harder to work with. But overall, the Traditions pistol kits are a less expensive way to test out and actually see if you're interested in muzzleloading and the kind of the work and labor and test involved with it before you go whole hog and and get something larger like a rifle or even into one of the more expensive nicer kits out there when it comes to just getting involved in muzzle loading and trying to pick your first muzzle loader muzzle loader kit i really recommend a percussion traditions pistol uh, for a, a couple reasons one percussion is a little bit easier to deal with than flintlock if you're just getting started Two, the pistols are a little bit more affordable. They're a little cheaper than some of the kit rifles that are out there. And three, if you're getting a kit, the pistol's a little bit less labor intensive. There's less things to do, less surface area for you to finish and work on than on some of the rifles. And you can really get a feel for if you want to you know, do more work really um, in getting a, uh, a muzzleloading rifle kit. Um, to finish. Now I say a kit to start out because you have a much more intimate experience with a kit than you do purchasing a finished muzzleloader. There's nothing wrong with purchasing a finished muzzleloader. You can get all the stuff and get out and go shooting, but I think if you build something from a kit or parts, you really understand how everything works as you're building it, and I think that helps expand your knowledge once you get ready to take it to the range and, uh, and start working up a load with it. Muzzleloaders are a really intimate shooting sport, more so than a lot of other shooting sports that are out there. And I think the more work you do on the front end, the more fun you'll have on the back end once you get out and start shooting and, and getting supplies for it. So in short, a Traditions cap lock pistol or pistol kit, I think is the great place to start. Cap or flint, which is more accurate? This question gets asked a lot and I think it really depends on uh, several factors. One being you, the shooter, and, and how well you know your muzzleloader. Two, the projectile that you're using, and three, the powder charge that you're using. Um, and then I think the last thing would be the lock. I think on some of the lower end flint locks out there, um, we, I see a lot of people with an extreme delay um, with their lock. And with a good lock and good powder, you should have no delay. It should just be snap, boom, done. It's downrange, just like on your cap. You pull the trigger, hammer falls, it's out, it's gone. Um, so I think the, the cap versus flint thing, it, it depends on, on several factors there. If you have a well-tuned flint lock, there should be no difference versus a cap lock. That's something I'm working on doing a little bit of testing with, with my um, tradition St. Louis Hawken and my Kibler flint lock rifle kit, um, just to kind of show people that if you have a slow flintlock, there are things that you can do to speed it up, and um, there really shouldn't be much of a difference across the board between either one. And I wanna say that even the cheapest locks out there right now produced in 2021 are good enough to be an accurate part of a muzzleloader. Um, I think it just takes a little bit for people to get used to, maybe a little tweaking, um, depending on the lock and the issue that they're having. Best custom maker for a custom made flintlock rifle. Um, there's no way that I can answer this without being unbiased. I have a lot of makers that I talk about on the show um, and on the website that I'm a big fan of. And a lot of them out there, I just haven't had a chance to mention yet. Um, so I really encourage people to hang out on the American Long Rifles Forum, hang out on Instagram where a lot of builders are really starting to get active and, uh, and the muzzleloading forum as well. And there's some Facebook groups out there where uh, a lot of builders hang out and talk shop and, and, and show what they can do. I think it really depends on what you're looking for in your muzzleloader, how much you're looking to spend and, uh, and what the builders around are wanting to make right now uh, for a lot of these builders out there building a muzzleloader is more of an art form than it is kind of a mechanical exercise um, so it kind of depends on what people want to be working on right now and how your project may or may not fit in so um, check those out check out kind of the muzzleloading hashtags out there on social media uh, i'm sure there's a builder out there that can build what you're looking for where can I find a cheap musket for a Revolutionary War reenactment? I think the go-to um, as far as like real baseline 
maybe not even functional are the muzzleloaders from veteran arms. All of those I believe are imported Pakistani or Indian muzzleloaders. Most of them aren't even, um, their touch holes and things aren't even drilled. Um, so they're not operable. Um, you can make them operable, but um, that's something that you kind of do at your own risk. And uh, it's something I don't think I'm prepared to really talk about <laughs> on in this video, especially. But um, Veteran Arms is kind of the import way to go. And then I think the step up, if you're wanting something that you can really work with, really play with, and really test out when it comes to muzzleloading, is going to be one of the traditions, uh, side lot traditional muzzleloaders out there. They have a variety of kind of U.S. military history muzzleloaders out there in varying degrees of accuracy. So it depends on what you're looking for and, and what you want. But those two traditions and veteran arms are kind of the starting point. Up from there, you have uh, one of the Petter Solis. They have a lot of military history uh, referenced and inspired muzzleloaders, again, in varying degrees of accuracy. But as far as cost goes, it goes veteran arms, traditions, Petter Soli, and then you kind of get into custom stuff or building your own custom kit from something like the Rifle Shop or Chambers or Track of the Wolf. The last question we have for this video is kind of a, an amalgamation, I think, of a, of a series of questions that I get a lot. And, and that's just, how do I get better at shooting my muzzleloader? And uh, it's not a complicated answer, um, and, and I'm not trying to diminish the question, but it really comes down to shooting more. Just like with any other firearm or shooting sports, it takes a lot of practice. And I think muzzle loading even more so because it is in a way old. Um, there's a lot of components. There's a lot of variables that go into every time you load that you just don't see when shooting modern cartridge or, um, or centerfire firearms out there. It can take quite a bit to feel confident and feel accurate with your muzzleloader. I really recommend starting out at 25 yards, shooting at uh, a silhouette or a paper target. You wanna make sure though that your muzzleloader is sighted in first. So take it to a range or take it into your backyard and shoot off of a table or a bench first. Get an idea of where you're shooting and, um, and start developing an accurate load group before you start heading out to competitions or woods walks or something. You will feel more confident going into a match where you know that you have an accurate group or that your muzzleloader can shoot an accurate group. Then it's just up to you and what's between your ears on making that happen and making those two things connect. One of the things I like to do to save a little money, save a little powder, save a little lead is shoot my air rifle. I have an old Beeman scoped air rifle. I think it goes up to like three or four power. Um, but I think shooting with an air rifle is very similar to shooting with a muzzleloader regardless of optic or sight setup because we have a low velocity and we have a, uh, a shooting sport that you have to load every time. So if you're shooting a modern centerfire gun, uh, even if it's a bolt action where you have to cock the bolt every time, you don't have really enough time to get out of the head shooting space. You don't have to break position or anything. You can kind of keep your head on the gun, in the sights, ready to go every time. But when you're shooting a muzzleloader, it's not the case. You have to break stance, you have to take it down, you have to reload. The same thing is with a traditional kind of pump air rifle where you do have to cock it and load it every time. And I think when it comes to muzzleloading, a lot of people aren't used to that, where you have to break your mental state, come out of you know, thinking about shooting and thinking about the target into thinking about loading. And that's where shooting an air rifle is a great practice because you have to come out of that stance and then you have to get back into it and get back on your target. It's also very cheap to shoot an air rifle. Um, the pellets are easy to come by. They're a little hard to come by right now, kind of 2020, 2021, but hopefully that's starting to remedy itself as production picks back up. Um, and with an air rifle, you have a similar range to a muzzleloader. You kind of at 25 to 50 yards, really, you're most accurate, which is where a lot of people like to play with their traditional muzzleloaders, that 25 to 50 yards. Um, so you have a good place and a good way to practice. Um, practice your shooting stance and practice your process um, in in regards to shooting your muzzleloader. I don't care what shooting sport you're talking about though, it's a lot of a head game. And the more you practice, the more familiar your head is gonna be with being in that mindset of wanting to hit that target every time, um, especially when you get into competition and things. Um, shooting is, I think, like 25% being able to shoot and 75% keeping your head in the game or keeping your head out of, you know, keeping your head out of your way is how I like to describe it. Um, once you've shot a lot and understand what you need to do, you don't really have to think a whole lot about it. Um, it's really kind of just natural for you to get on target get to where you want to be and be able to squeeze that trigger, your head can kind of be separate from where you're shooting. Uh, and, and maybe that's a little too deep. Maybe that's something for another video talking about competitive muzzle loading and things. But 
Um, practice practicing with an air rifle. Um, my go-to target for my air rifle is a tin can turned on end. So you're shooting at the small end of the can at 25 yards. That kind of emulates the 910 X-ring on a lot of targets uh, at 25 yards. And it can be really humbling <laughs> to shoot that tin can and, and try to hit that metal every time. And I guarantee you, you spend a few nights a week shooting that for a month, you're gonna get much better at shooting in general and much better at shooting your muzzleloader um, than you were before. If you don't have an air rifle or and you wanna just get practice specifically with your muzzleloader and don't wanna burn powder, something you can do is whittle a wooden flint for your flintlock clamp that into the jaws of your flintlock and practice with that. That's gonna help you get rid of that flinch that is common with your flintlock. And then with your percussion muzzle loader, a lot of people will put kind of a rubber washer or a rubber end on their nipple so that when they drop their hammer after pulling the trigger dry firing, they're not smashing the end of their nipple with their hammer, especially when there's not a cap there. Another tip I have for people, you know, struggling with shooting their muzzleloader because of the lock time or the smoke is to just focus on your sights kind of past the lock, especially when people are new to shooting their flint locks. It's hard to get used to that fireball right next to your eye. But um, the more you shoot and the more you practice, you'll find yourself looking through the sights at the target. You get to the point where you don't even notice the smoke or the fire, you know, just a couple inches away from your eyes. As always, it's really important to wear your uh, safety glasses, regardless of what muzzleloader that you're shooting. Uh, if you're shooting a, a traditional cap muzzleloader, you always have the risk of some shrapnel of that cap coming back. And with your flint, you're not necessarily worried about the spark or the fire. Uh, most of the time that is all projected forward, kind of going over the frizzen and towards the muzzle. But you always have a concern there of flint shrapnel or um, you know, powder sparks or anything maybe coming back and getting into your eyes. You always wanna protect your eyes and your ears uh, in any shooting sport and uh, muzzleloading especially because we do have some things involved in muzzleloading that we don't really worry about when it comes to uh, modern firearms. That's all the questions we have in regards to muzzleloading for today. I hope that you've enjoyed the video and I hope maybe you learned something. If you have a question that you'd like me to share on video, you can send it to ilovemuzzleloading at gmail.com or submit it on Instagram. Like I said, we do one of these about once a week and try to answer your burning muzzleloading questions. I'm Ethan, I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time.